All right. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for uh, coming to this session. Good afternoon. And I uh, uh, just wanted to introduce myself first. My name is uh, Nihar Bihani. I'm a senior product manager at Amazon Web Services, uh, which is Amazon's cloud computing business. Uh, the specific product that I manage is called Amazon CloudFront. It's a content delivery service by AWS. Um, and I also have uh, Jerome here with me from JW Player. Uh, did you want to? Yeah. Um, my name is Jerome. I'm head of product for JW Player, the video player. Great. So we'll go ahead and uh, get started. Uh, we'll be talking today about using AWS to create an end-to-end -end, uh, HLI streaming stack. Uh, so this session uh, will be a combination of uh, both walking through some slides, giving you some background information about um, uh, streaming your media, uh, the, the media workflow, uh, as well as talking about Amazon Web Services and some of the services there. Jerome will talk a little bit about JW Player. And we also want to spend a good amount of time just looking at uh, how you can configure um, an end-to-end -end media workflow uh, to deliver uh, video over HLS. So first, I'll start with uh, talking about the components of a media streaming stack. So we're not just talking about delivery of media here, but we're talking about also the, the ingest, the uh, storage, the processing of your media before you can start talking about uh, delivering that media over to the users and the devices. Uh, I'll talk uh, briefly about uh, using some of the AWS services to create that entire streaming stack, that end-to-end -end workflow. Uh, Jerome will talk about media players and the role of media players and the importance of players in that workflow because players are really where your end users are interacting with your media. Uh, so that's their sort of first impression, their first experience. And then we'll go into the demo and do a, a demo and, and walk through um, the AWS console as well as how we can configure JW Player. So let's first talk about ingesting media into the cloud. Um, Media companies traditionally have had storage on premise. Um, there's, there's a variety of different reasons for that. Security is one of them. Um, sort of you know, control over that storage, another. Also, you know, cloud is certainly a, a fairly new technology, only been around for the last uh, seven or eight years. Uh, so, you know, and, and these companies also have uh, tiered storage, different types of storage for different use cases. So you can imagine having uh, really uh, working storage for things like edit base uh, or your local SAN storage. You can, talk, uh, you can think about um, for your current working set and current media having some sort of a, you know, a, a bigger storage space for that. Or even um, archival storage, which is uh, traditionally being tape type storage, which is more offline storage and may even be off-site and not necessarily even on-premise. Uh, but as, uh, but but more recently, the content owners are realizing that um, you know they can't really keep up with all of the demands and all of the needs of their uh, of the storage. It's primarily because of two reasons. One, the the actual content is the the number of uh, the types of content is really increasing. Uh, there's a lot of content from network or cable providers with hundreds of channels there. There is user generated content. Um, and uh, there's also the, the traditional uh, sort of movies and other content that you may have. And in addition to the types of content, there's also the size of content that's increasing as well. So we're moving from SD to HD to 3D, uh, and just the size of each of your media files is continuing to increase. So both of these combined are creating a, a scaling and a cost challenge for media companies. Uh, and so a lot, of, a lot of media companies, a lot of the customers I've been talking to, they are trying to figure out ways to ingest all of their media into the cloud so that they can scale in a cost-effective way. And there are a number of different options available for ingesting that content into the cloud. Um, there is the traditional move it over the wire over the internet. There is um, having a direct connect, a direct fiber connection to the cloud provider uh, and being able to send the content that way. Uh, also, there are software acceleration solutions out there, such as Aspera and others, that are available as uh, partners in the AWS cloud. Um, and finally, there's also the uh, just shipping physical disks to the uh, to the cloud provider, 
and just uh, ingesting content that way. So there's a variety of different options available that you can use based on what your needs are. So you know, once you've sort of ingested all of that content into the, uh, into the cloud, and uh, like I said, there is the, the, the types of content as well as the size of content is both increasing. Um, there is also another problem once that content is in the cloud when you start processing that content, when you start processing your media into different output renditions for all the different devices that you need to support, all the different codecs and container files, the different resolutions, and so on. And that really creates an exponential increase in the, in the volume of content that you need to store and archive. Durability becomes a concern as well, making multiple copies of your content so you don't lose this content that you have uh, created and processed. Uh, that becomes a concern. That's something on-premise you need to manage yourself. But in a cloud environment, that's something the cloud provider can give you without you needing to worry about making multiple copies. You can even put your content in different geographic regions, whether it's two different coasts or maybe even two different continents to get the highest possible durability that you may need. There's also uh, policies that you can set um, in terms of uh, moving your content from current storage to archival based on how frequently your content is being ex accessed. Um, and all of those automated settings can also help you save on the, the costs that, uh, of storing that content in current storage versus archival, which is typically much less expensive to store your content in an archival uh, uh, in a storage facility. Uh, and finally, uh, you also want to ensure that there is the, the same tools and the solutions that you're used to uh, using for your content are available in the, uh, in the cloud. Um, so all of the partner solutions or the third party solutions that you may be trusting and relying on, uh, availability of those solutions is an important factor as well. Um, and there's actually a virtuous cycle there where you move, when, when there is more content in the cloud, there are more of those solution providers and those solutions that become available in the cloud, which leads to more content being uploaded and stored into the cloud. So there's a, there's a virtual cycle there. Here's a, a block diagram that uh, sort of gives you an overview of the ingest and storage architecture. So if you look at uh, the bottom left here, you see your content mezzanine files as well as the metadata files. Um, and uh, the, the, the content is going via Direct Connect, which is a direct fiber connection into Amazon S3, which is that big block up towards the top center. Um, and uh, you know, on the, on the bottom uh, of this uh, picture, you see the metadata going into content management servers running on Amazon EC2 with database servers in the back. So this is just a typical architecture for ingest and storage of your media. And uh, just gives you an example of the different AWS services that you can use for this architecture. Uh, so let's talk about, you know, once you have ingested your content into the cloud and you have stored the, the content there, let's talk about processing that content and creating the different renditions, the differ, different transcodes that you need to create for the different device types that you need to serve. So transcoding is a process by which you are taking your high resolution, your source files or your mezzanine files and translating that into the various codecs, uh, into the right bit rates, into the right uh, screen sizes that you need to support that, uh, for the different platforms that you're delivering your content to. In addition, uh, you also need to think about transmuxing. You need to think about the, uh, the different containers that you want to uh, package your content, your media files into. And uh, you know, in terms of uh, packaging and delivery protocols, there have been some traditional delivery protocols that have been in the market for a long time, uh, but they've had some issues with firewalls and such, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. But uh, most of the modern delivery protocols, uh, such as HDS, HLS, Smooth, and MPEG-Dash, are really all HTTP-based that don't have the, those firewall issues, and they're based on this concept of segmenting. So you take your source file, you transcode that into multiple bit rates, and then segment that into smaller chunks um, that these devices can consume. Um, these chunks are anywhere from two seconds to 10 seconds uh, long. And there are a couple of different ways in which you can create these chunks. Uh, there's file level segmenting and virtual segmenting, and we'll talk about that in the next few slides. First, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, sort of data on this chart, but 
just wanted to highlight, I'm not going to spend much time there, but in terms of audio and video codecs, so codec is just an abbreviation uh, or an acronym for compressor and decompressor. So it's really a mechanism for you to take your high resolution, your high definition source files and compress that so you can deliver it to different devices um, based on the requirements of those devices and save cost in terms of network uh, bandwidth capacity as well as uh, storage space. And there's a couple of different um, sort of ways you can do the compression. There's lossy or lossless. Uh, lossy is something that you would use, for instance, when you have your high resolution file and you want to deliver to, uh, say, a phone screen size device. Um, you know, there, even if you lose some of the quality from your HD to the phone screen size, uh, the user experience is not impacted. Uh, lossless is something you would use before delivery when you're actually processing that file or you're um, you know, generating that file and so forth. Uh, in terms of the different codecs that most uh, content owners are standardizing on these days, it's really uh, uh, you know, H.264 for video, HEAC for audio, and then uh, in an MP4 container. So that's what we see uh, most customers using today. So I, I mentioned MP4 is the, the container. Uh, this gives you a, really a list of all the different container types that are available. Um, MP4 has its roots in uh, QuickTime and Adobe Flash, so um, it's sort of been around for a while. Uh, it's also what we see most customers use today. Uh, we also see some usage of WebM and, and Matroska uh, with the MKV file extension. Uh, there's also Microsoft's Advanced Streaming Format, or ASF, uh, which is uh, used for the Windows uh, media platforms. Uh, AVI is another Microsoft container format, and then FLV is the, uh, the Flash container. This uh, slide is actually uh, you know, a little bit more interesting in terms of our discussion today and when it comes to delivery protocols. Um, so I'll start with the top. You see progressive download, uh, which is something that YouTube has used for a long time, although YouTube is now starting to move to adaptive bitrate uh, streaming protocols. But progressive download is where the server is sending the entire file over to the, the user or the client. Uh, the entire file gets downloaded and then played by the user. So there's a lot of bandwidth that's uh, sent over the wire there, even if the user doesn't watch the entire video. So there is, there is, I think of that as there is little intelligence in the progressive download uh, delivery protocol. Then there is uh, other traditional streaming protocols, such as RTMP or RTSP, that overcome this, uh, this challenge of downloading the entire file. Because with RTMP, you're only delivering the, the piece of content that the users are actually consuming. But uh, they have the issues of the firewall that we spoke of uh, previously. Um, there's also pseudo streaming, which is HTTP based, so it doesn't have the firewall issues, um, but that requires more intelligence on both the server and the client to communicate and be able to uh, uh, deliver the bytes. For completeness, I also have radio streaming here, which is based on the proprietary protocols, Shoutcast and Icecast. Uh, but adaptive bitrate streaming, which is HTTP based, is really where we'll spend the bulk of our time today. Uh, this is what we see most customers use and the industry moving towards. Um, so adaptive bitrate streaming is where you take your source level file and transcode that into multiple bitrates, and then you also have a playlist that references each of those bitrates for the player. Um, these bitrates are then segmented into smaller chunks, as I talked about earlier. Uh, and then the player is in constant communication with the server, and based on the network bandwidth available at the, at the player and other factors, uh, the player can request a different bitrate uh, from the server. So the flavors of adaptive bitrate streaming that are there today, there is uh, Microsoft Smooth Streaming, which is uh, uh, you know, popular on the Xbox, the Windows Phone, and other st Silverlight platforms. There's also Apple's HTTP Live Streaming, or HLS, um, and this is uh, primarily for iOS devices and also some of the modern uh, Android devices. Uh, we have uh, Adobe's HTTP Dynamic Streaming, which is primarily for Flash-based devices. Excuse me. Uh, and that's uh, really targeted mostly towards PCs because Flash support is, uh, is it's not quite available on many devices. And then uh, MPEG Dash is uh, sort of an industry standard that's emerging. Uh, and there's been some traction recently with MPEG Dash where a lot of the content owners and tool providers are starting to use MPEG Dash as the delivery protocol. 
So there, there's a lot of, um, there isn't really one consistent way of doing the adaptive bitrate streaming even today, although HTTP live streaming is something that we uh, see has gained a lot of popularity, and that's what we'll be talking about in the demo today as well. So I want to talk a little bit about stream generation for an adaptive bitrate stream. Uh, so I mentioned in an earlier slide, there's a couple of different ways you can do stream generation. You can either pre-encode the files, your source files or your mezzanine files, uh, directly where they are stored. Uh, or you can have streaming servers in your delivery chain so that you can um, encode these files and segment them on the fly as you're delivering this media. So, you know, both of these options have their, uh, have their advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the pre-encoding of uh, files, it's, it's really uh, straightforward and scalable, um, but, it's, uh, you know, but you're having to encode your files ahead of time, so um, you know, there's, there's a lot of small segments and potentially chunks to manage depending on the size of your media library. Uh, so it's, it's more suitable for popular content where you can encode it once and then you can start delivering it over and over to uh, the players uh, for this popular content that they're requesting. Uh, you know, using streaming servers such as the Adobe Media Server or the Microsoft IIS Server um, or Wowza, uh, you, can, you can use that media server for doing dynamic sort of on-demand um, and on-the-fly encoding and segmenting of your video files. Uh, and that's really beneficial for long-tail content where you don't need to pre-encode it and store it because that content is only requested once or very few number of times. Um, but it does bring on the complexity of figuring out how you would scale that, that setup, that architecture. And also there's more moving parts in terms of there's a media server that you now need to run and manage. Uh, global delivery for your media content to end users around the world. Um, you know, this is important. Uh, this is also very important because now you're sort of inching closer and closer towards your end users. Uh, with, with the final interaction with the, uh, or you know, from the end user's perspective, the first interaction being the player and then sort of the delivery network and how quickly they can, uh, they can uh, download that stream. So you see in this block diagram here, there's an example of uh, Apple HLS, the Adobe HDS, and Microsoft Smooth, all three um, sort of delivery protocols. And uh, you know, all three of these are supported by Amazon CloudFront, which is the content delivery service uh, at AWS. And with these three protocols, you can practically cover you know, any device on Earth and, and delivering your media content to that device. Um, so a content delivery network and being able to cache your content close to end users can help improve performance, uh, help you scale and handle uh, any flash crowds or popularity of content. Uh, it also helps increase availability because now you have a network of edge servers all around the world that are built for high availability so that even if one fails, the other one can start taking the traffic from your end users. Uh, media players and devices. Uh, I'm not going to spend too much time here at all because uh, Jerome is here and he'll, he'll go into the details of uh, sort of players and devices and their importance. The only thing I'll, I'll highlight here is that there is a huge fragmentation, a large number of devices and players today that you, would, that you need to support. And that creates a huge challenge in terms of being able to deliver your media content to all of these devices in the most efficient way, as well as the highest quality uh, that you want your end users to be able to see. From a security perspective, uh, this is another area that uh, can be uh, daunting and, and challenging in terms of the complexity here. Uh, there's a lot of uh, sort of protocol-specific uh, security implementations. So, for instance, Smooth Streaming has uh, the Play Ready DRM uh, that works well with Smooth Streaming uh, players. Um, Adobe has their Adobe Access product. There's also a number of third-party DRM solutions that are available. Um, I think the 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 key takeaway really here is um, that security is is something that I think of as a speed bump. There's a number of security options that are out there, and the level of security that you want to provide or that you want to implement should be commensurate with the, with the, um, uh, with sort of the content that you're delivering. So something like the nightly news that becomes stale very quickly 
is not something that you'd want to DRM. But at the same time, uh, something like a first-run Hollywood movie, uh, you would want the highest possible security for that. So let me talk a little bit about using AWS to create uh, a media streaming stack. So AWS not only has the, the fundamental building block services for things like ingesting data into the cloud, storing, processing this data, uh, or delivering it to end users, uh, AWS also has um, a growing and a vast number of solution providers and partners on the platform who are, um, uh, who are able to sort of provide you the management and the processing uh, capabilities and functions that you need for your media when it's up on the cloud and you need to manage that. Um, the AWS Marketplace is, uh, is, a, is an online store where you can uh, find, buy, and um, quickly uh, start using some of these solutions. The cloud also gives you a cost-effective way to scale. And, and this is really one of the big things that attracts a lot of content owners who have large libraries that are growing exponentially um, to cloud because you have the pay-as-you-go pricing model where you can scale the resources as you need on demand and then scale them back down when, you, when, you, when your demand goes down. Cloud also give you a, an instant global footprint. Uh, AWS has nine regions around the world that are available, and CloudFront has 46 edge locations around the world. So it, it gives you sort of that instant access to using any of these global infrastructure components um, just with an API call. And then uh, the AWS Cloud also has some media-specific capabilities. So the MPAA, or the uh, Motion Picture Association of America, uh, they have... Um, a set of security best practices and standards. And about a year ago, AWS infrastructure was deemed compliant with a lot of those uh, MPAA um, security practices for uh, storing, processing, as well as delivering your media content or your protected content to end users. In terms of storing and managing your media assets on AWS, there is uh, three different services that i like to highlight, uh, Amazon S3, Amazon Glacier and AWS Storage Gateway. Um, Amazon S3 is um, a file-based or an object-based store. Uh, and a lot of our media customers are using Amazon S3 to store copies of their, uh, of their media content on S3. Uh, S3 provides really high durability. S3 gives you 11 nines of durability um, and a lot of different security features that you can implement on S3. Amazon Glacier is uh, a service uh, more f suited for archiving and backup, for long-term backup of your, uh, of your media content. Uh, Glacier is uh, really inexpensive with uh, archiving of a gigabyte of data for as low as a penny a month. Uh, so you can use, a lot of customers are using this service for archiving a lot of their content for a long period of time. And then AWS Storage Gateway provides you uh, sort of uh, a link between your on-premise IT infrastructure and the AWS cloud um, for secure uh, and scalable, seamless backups of your, of your content, whether that's the media content or the metadata into the AWS infrastructure. In terms of uh, processing your uh, content uh, in the AWS cloud, we have the Amazon Elastic Transcoder, which is a, a transcoding service that we launched uh, earlier this year. And, um, uh, this is a service that a lot of our customers are using to uh, transcode uh, on-demand media, both audio and video content, uh, into the different uh, for the different devices and the different codecs uh, and so forth that uh, that they need to deliver uh, to. the uh, The service is really designed to be um, cost-effective, scalable, and really easy to use. Uh, you can use the service via the management console or the APIs. Uh, or you can integrate um, uh, our SDKs that interact with the service into your own application and infrastructure. The, uh, this, the transcoder service also provides a lot of uh, sort of custom presets uh, or, or canned presets for either the breadth of devices that you want to reach and that you want to encode your, uh, your media content for, 
or um, device specific presets. So if you wanted to provide a really great experience for your users on the Kindle Fire HD or the, uh, the iPod Touch, um, you know, there are device specific um, presets for encoding also available. And then on to uh, delivering that media content to end users globally uh, using Amazon CloudFront, which supports uh, all of the HTTP adaptive bitrate streaming formats such as HLS, HDS, Smooth, uh, and, and the MPEG Dash. Um, uh, CloudFront also has a lot of the streaming specific caching optimizations. So what I mean there is we have um, uh, different optimizations for uh, how we fetch content from the origin to, uh, to the edge servers, or how we um, uh, you know, uh, work with different networks and transit providers uh, in terms of peering and uh, create high throughput network connectivity so that we can give a great experience to end users that uh, you are delivering your content to. Um, there's, uh, there's also a lot of data and, and metrics that we're looking at in terms of uh, viewer experience, whether that's uh, rebuffering or number of retransmits uh, and so forth. So all of these uh, data and inputs we're looking at constantly uh, monitoring and alarming on and using that as inputs to create further caching optimizations for the service. Uh, CloudFront has, like I said, 46 edge locations today uh, and uh, also has a lot of joint uh, solutions with some of the streaming ISV partners such as Adobe Media Server, uh, Microsoft's IS Server, as well as the WOWS Media Server. Here's another uh, block diagram. Um, kind of a complicated diagram, but what I really wanted to show here is if you look at the end user uh, towards the middle, uh, bottom left, uh, who's interacting with CloudFront in multiple different ways. So CloudFront can be used to deliver these the static assets uh, sitting in either S3 or a custom origin server. So these could be your uh, pre-encoded media files uh, that you're delivering directly from your storage via a CDN like CloudFront. Uh, or on the on the bottom right, you see another path that shows how CloudFront can be put in the in the in the path for delivering live content, um, where there is a live stream source uh, in the far right, that where you're capturing the live stream, and then uh, there is a media server running on Amazon e Amazon EC2 that's encoding that live stream and delivering it to CloudFront. So at this point, I'll uh, hand it over to Jerome to talk about uh, media players in the streaming stack. Thank you. Um, so Nihar talked a lot about the um, um, like everything that needs to get done before the video ends up with the end user. And I now want to talk a little bit about uh, when that video is with the end user and everything that happens around it. Um, in a way, the media player is the hub where everything from content to user experience comes together. And um, it's really the thing that makes or breaks uh, your, uh, your end user experience. If it works great, uh, everybody's happy. If one of the components does not work, then the entire setup breaks. Um, and then the, the video player can support all kinds of different playback models, just like the, the backend uh, supports uh, progressive, uh, the older, um, more persistent uh, streaming protocols or the newer uh, HTTP adaptive streaming protocols, uh, plus the security. And then um, why would you, why would you um, use a video player? Um, there's the HTML5 video elements that solves a lot of problems. Um, but it's not just about the playback. It's just not just about having um, that video in front of your viewer. It's also about having a great user experience and a very e effective way to do what the goal is of your video content, being that selling products, um, selling advertising. Um, there's a lot of things around that experience that, that need to happen. Uh, think about branding, so make sure that, that um, your design, your player design is smoothly integrated with your website and has your logo or your company watermark on it. Uh, analytics are important to see who is watching your video and, and where your video is most uh, effective and where it breaks apart so you can also steer and, and 
make sure that you, you fix the, uh, the items that are not working well. Um, on the security side, um, if you have an HTML5 video tag, uh, somebody can view source, download your video, which is uh, sometimes nice uh, if you <laughs> really want to distribute your content, uh, but it's also uh, not wanted for, for people that have, uh, that monetize that content and, and don't want others to profit from it. So there's a range of features that, that video players generally support. And then on the monetization side, there's the whole stack of VAST, VPAID, and, and VMAP standard, standards for, for advertising around your content. Uh, in terms of branding, uh, you want the consistent user experience, but there is also a lot more functionality next to the player transport controls that, that the general player frameworks are providing. And then think about uh, options to sh share your video with other people, uh, full screen, immersive, playback, and um, playlist or related videos to have viewers keep on watching more content. So it's not just one file, they just keep going and going. Uh, on the analytics side, uh, they're, they're really, they're, there's the, the viewer analytics, uh, so how much are people watching from my videos, and uh, where do they rewind, so which parts are hot, and where do they drop off, so which parts are not hot. Uh, and then there's also the uh, more QoS metrics, which, you can, which helps you to inform like, where the, um, uh, whether your bit rates are good enough, whether uh, people are seeing a lot of rebuffering, where people are seeing a lot of stalling and are eventually also moving away. And then in terms of uh, security, there is, um, there's DRM schemes to make sure that uh, your content is, is completely locked down. Uh, but there are other, also other uh, security mechanisms to either ensure that people uh, cannot grab your video player, put it on their website. That is what uh, CloudFront uh, supports with its uh, private content functionality. And uh, there is also just HTTPS to make sure that the transport layer is secured. Uh, not every video player, not every video uh, platform is, is capable of supporting that. And in terms of monetization, uh, important items to, to, to keep in mind around uh, video players is does it support the IAB standard? So I'm not locked up into one certain ad network, but I can switch. Uh, think about uh, VAST, VPAID, and VMAP. And uh, do those standards also work across desktop and mobile? So as your audience shifts uh, from desktops to uh, iPads and Android phones, uh, am I still able to monetize that content? Uh, a lot of um, things are going, uh, are going on around uh, interactivity of ads. Uh, think about like A, B polls, like do, do you want to see this ad, do you want to see that ad? Uh, did you like this ad, was it relevant for you? Uh, ad skipping is something that, that gets widely deployed these days. Those things are really very helpful to optimize your monetization. Uh, a lot of these items increase uh, your CPMs. And then finally, um, separate from advertising, uh, you, can, you can look at paywalls, uh, either um, pay-per-views, so somebody pays one dollar for a video, or uh, like monthly subscriptions, such as uh, Netflix and Hulu are providing. So this is a bit of an overview of what both uh, AWS is offering and JW Player is offering. And uh, what we now want to look at is really a demo of let's walk through the stack for one video. And um, uh, for that, we're going to use um, a single HLS video. Um, we're encoding to HLS because that is one format that allows, um, the, that allows you to deliver to more or less any device that, that, that is widely used. Um, JW Player is able to actually play HLS on desktop devices uh, using the Flash plugin. And um, we, we're also moving that to HTML5 in, in the short term. Um, on iOS, it's built in, and it's actually required for, for mobile apps. So um, it's, HLS is a streaming format you need anyway. 
And on Android, uh, there is some support on newer devices uh, over 4.0. Um, but uh, JW Player and others are, are providing SDKs to stream HLS to lower versions of Android as well. And then finally, you're seeing that a lot of uh, over-the-top systems like those from Roku, Apple TV, and a new system like Chromecast is supporting HLS. So it's really the one format that allows you to reach everything. Now I'll hand it over to you to uh, actually jump into Amazon. Yeah. All right, so uh, at this point, we'll switch gears and uh, start looking at the demo. So I'll uh, start with the AWS Management Console. Um, all of uh, the AWS services have a Management Console, so you can see the list of services here. Uh, the ones that we'll primarily use today for this demo are Amazon CloudFront, uh, which is the content delivery service. We'll uh, use Amazon Elastic Transcoder, which is the transcoding service. Uh, and Amazon S3, which is our storage service that I talked about. So we'll start with uh, Amazon S3, and uh, first we'll go ahead and create a new Amazon S3 bucket. So S3 has this notion of buckets, um, and uh, I'll create a new bucket here, just call it Streaming Media West 2013. Uh, you can create the bucket in any of these uh, regions where S3 is available. Uh, I'll pick the one closest to here, uh, just go with Northern California. Uh, and I'll just say create a bucket. Uh, so we should be able to see this bucket towards the bottom here. Uh, there's the bucket that we just created. If I go into that bucket, I can upload the video that we will encode using Amazon as, uh, Elastic Transcoder uh, and then deliver it using CloudFront. So I'll just say add files, and I'll go ahead and upload this uh, video, which I'll show you in a second uh, what that video is about. Um, I'll go ahead and set the permissions for this file that I'm uploading into this bucket and make it public so that it can be accessed by Amazon Elastic Transcoder and it can also be accessed by um, the, uh, the player uh, and the CloudFront content delivery service. And then just say start uploading. Uh, so taking a quick look at this, uh, this video file, Uh, so this is, uh, I'm, I'm just in the QuickTime player and I'm uh, looking at the file. Uh, this is basically a, a file that was recorded by my colleague, uh, David Said, and uh, it's, uh, it's him uh, driving to work. Uh, and it's a one minute video. Uh, the only thing I wanted to sh show you here first is uh, the format of the file is in H.264 uh, with AAC for audio encoding. So as this uh, file is uploading, uh, we'll go ahead and create a couple of um, other buckets here. Uh, so first we'll, so that's the bucket that I just created is sort of where the, this MP4 file is. Um, and that's the uh, input file for Elastic Transcoder. I'll also create an output bucket. Uh, so I'll call that uh, out and I'll create this in the same Northern California region. Uh, and then finally I'll uh, create another bucket uh, also in Northern California for uh, the thumbnails that the Elastic Transcoder service will generate as we, uh, uh, as we transcode this file. So I'll just call that thumbnails. So I've created uh, all three of the buckets uh, that I'm gonna need. Um, but I, you know, instead of uh, using these buckets, I wanted to show you uh, buckets that I had already created earlier. So you look, you can look at, uh, just call them my last name, Bihani In. Uh, so here's the, the file that was uploaded into this bucket. Uh, I also created a web directory uh, where I put the file also, and I'll show you why uh, when we configure Amazon CloudFront for delivery. Uh, the other bucket that I created is the Bihani HLS out. Again, this was previously created. Uh, I put the cross domain file here at the root of this bucket, and I also created a a subdirectory here where the files that would be encoded by using Amazon Elastic Transcoder are available so these files can be delivered via the player, uh, the JW player to end users. So let's look at uh, Amazon Elastic Transcoder. So Transcoder has this concept of pipelines 
where you define the input bucket where your media is at and the output S3 bucket that you want the, the transported files to live in. Uh, so which is why we created uh, two different buckets uh, on Amazon S3. So we can create a new pipeline here, um, give that pipeline a name, Um, the input bucket, you can see a list of the buckets, so we'll just go with the buckets that I had uh, just created uh, for this demo, so String Media West 2013. Um, I'll leave the, uh, the Elastic uh, Transcoder default role. This is basically the identity and access management role so that um, you can restrict access to your media content in S3 only and only give content to Elastic Transcoder. You can create a custom policy as well. And then for the output bucket, I will put uh, the out bucket that I created um, and put the file uh, and create, uh, use the standard. Uh, so S3 has two different options available for storage, uh, standard storage or reduced redundancy storage. Reduced redundancy is less expensive, but you get uh, lower durability for your content. Um, in terms of uh, permissions, I'll use Amazon S3 group uh, as, the, as the default permission here and give access to, uh, to all users. And then for thumbnails, if you remember, I had also created a thumbnails bucket, uh, so that's the SMW 2013 thumbnails bucket. Uh, again, I'll use the standard uh, storage class here, give uh, permissions uh, to Amazon S3 group in terms of who can access that bucket and say all users can access it and open download. You can also create notifications uh, that notify you automatically how your uh, uh, transcoding job is progressing uh, and when it's finished. We're not gonna set that up right now, but that's, that's a uh, feature available as well. And then we'll go ahead and create this pipeline. So then if you go to uh, job, so this is where we define the input bucket and the output bucket for your transcoding pipeline. And I can create a new job in this pipeline that I just created. Um, so I'd say create a new job. Uh, this is the pipeline that I want to use. And then this automatically shows me all of the media files that are available in my input bucket. Uh, I only have one file there right now, the file that I, out, uh, that I uploaded. And then I can create an output uh, prefix. Um, I can also uh, use, so I, was, I mentioned that there are uh, predefined presets that are available. So I can use the HLS presets. And since I will be doing adaptive bitrate streaming, I'll uh, do three different uh, uh, encodes for this file. So I'll start with the, the lowest quality here, 400K. Uh, the segment duration. Uh, for HLS, I'll just use 10 seconds here, which is standard. Um, and then output key, I'll say HLS, this is the 400K um, file. I also want to uh, add two more outputs. So I will add uh, a second preset for HLS also. This time I'll use one meg. Again, the segment duration will be 10 seconds. And the output key, I'll call this one HLS. 1M. And then the uh, final output uh, for my third uh, bitrate, I'll do HLS 2M or 2 meg. I'll go ahead and uh, make this segment duration also 10. And then output key, I'll say HLS 2M. The final thing I want to do is I want to create a playlist. Uh, that references each of these three different bitrate files that we're creating. So uh, call the master playlist whatever I want. I'll just call it master here. Um, and then the different outputs in my master playlist that I want to reference for the player are the 400K, the 1 meg, and the 2 megs. And then that's really it. So this is how I, I create a, a transcoding job. And then I just say, uh, create new job. Oops. Just say drive. Ah. 
Here we go. At least the instruction is helpful here. Then go ahead and create a new job. So now the job is running. You can go to uh, jobs here and uh, look up the, uh, the job uh, under the SMW 2013 demo pipeline, and you can see that the job is progressing. Um, so instead of waiting for this job to get done, which can take a few minutes, uh, I'll just show you um, uh, the previous uh, job that I had already created. Um, and uh, the output of that job is in the, uh, the Bihani HLS out bucket uh, that, I had, uh, that I had shown you earlier. So all of these segments and all of the files are already created here. So you can see the master.m3u8, which is the master playlist that references the 400K and the one meg and the two meg um, encoded output files. And then you can see the .ts files, which are the different segments uh, that will be the, the output of this encode. And then finally, uh, I, I wanna go to the Amazon CloudFront console. Uh, and CloudFront is where uh, I can configure a distribution for delivering this, these HLS segments and these HLS files to viewers uh, globally. So I create a web distribution so that I can deliver this content over HTTP. Uh, I create my origin bucket, which um, in this case is the SMW 2013 out. The out bucket, if you remember, is where the output of the encoding process, those .ts files and the n 3 uit files were, uh, were put. Uh, and just simply say create distribution. You, there are a lot of other options available in Amazon CloudFront in terms of um, um, you can set uh, a domain name or a C name for your distribution so that your users don't have to type the D2, T03, this, uh, this non-descript uh, domain name, but instead they can type you know, mysite.com. Uh, you can also do uh, logging so that we can uh, capture access logs on the server side, as Jerome mentioned, and be able to show quality of service in terms of cache hit rates and so forth. Uh, you can also set multiple origins and multiple cache behaviors. So let me actually flip back to the distribution I already have created. Uh, and you can see that I've created three different origins here, uh, which are three different S3 buckets. So the first one, which is the default um, S3 bucket, is the HLS out bucket. I also have an in bucket and a thumbnails bucket. And the way I'm utilizing all three of these buckets is um, for any path that says web slash, uh, I go to the in bucket. This will be the fallback to the MP4 uh, file for devices or players that won't support uh, HLS. There's also the thumbnails bucket for uh, the thumbnails for this file, and then the default uh, where all of the HLS outputs are, uh, so you can see the HLS bucket referenced here. So since this distribution is already configured, um, what I wanted to show you is if you look at uh, this particular domain name, which is the d2qo uh, data, you know, cloudfront.net, uh, I've also created an index.html file referencing the same CloudFront distribution. Uh, and this is where the HLS video will be playing. Um, I want Jerome to actually show some of the player configurations and how the player is configured. So once you've uploaded the video into S3, created the transcoding pipeline and the job, and transcoded your video, and then created a CloudFront distribution, the final step would be configuring the player. So I'll have Jerome show that, and then we have a bit.ly URL for you where you can actually go and play the, uh, the video. Thank you. Uh, let's see, I think we have to race through it a little bit. Um, So with the, uh, with the output of the, of the Amazon transcoder is uh, twofold. There is a thumbnail uh, or a strip of thumbnails and there is an HLS stream or a couple of playlists with uh, lots of small chunks. So what, what I'll show you is to, to very, uh, like to load both of them in, into JW player and uh, get a video player that plays those HLS streams across uh, formats and devices. So in our, um, 
in our dashboard, we actually have a handy tool for that. Our uh, player, uh, our player wizard that allows you to uh, very like visually configure the uh, the video player, so you don't have to uh, manually uh, put in a lot of JavaScript code. So here was the poster image, which we'll put in. Then we have the 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 URL which we'll also add in and with those two files you already have a fully working uh, uh, video player that does HLS across the board so here it is um, We'll set the, the video player to be responsive. That means that uh, the video player automatically scales to the size of the device. Uh, so very useful if you're building a responsive website. Um, you can skin the video player. Uh, we have various, uh, various options built in that, that you can use as, as, a, as a player uh, editor. Uh, you can build your own skin as well. Uh, and, and then there are items you can set to control the behavior and uh, the, the display of the video player. Um, the most, like these are the most sensible options. What I, what I will do is um, make sure that we'll have a uh, download fallback. Uh, that allows JW Player to basically present a nice looking download of a video for devices that support neither Flash nor HTML5. So think about older uh, Nokia phones or uh, people that use proxy browsers like Opera and um, uh, uh, various like Chinese uh, proxy uh, browsers. So with all of that set, uh, you get the embed code, and the embed code uh, you paste into your web page, um, which I've done here as well. And uh, the video player itself, this is JW player, you put in the, in the header of your website, and then in the content of your site, at the location you want to place the video, uh, you paste the, the embed block. Uh, this one has, in addition to the poster image and the, uh, the HLS stream, it has the older, uh, or the original video from Nihar, so um, uh, somebody who does not have Flash or HTML5 can still download a video. Uh, and it also has a thumb strip, which is a, a fairly new and nifty feature. I'll quickly show that. Uh, so it allows you to uh, seek to specific por portions of the video and, and get a visual feedback before you actually start seeking to that. Uh, to that player, so this is uh, this is the full uh, video streaming from cloud, like encoded with Amazon Encoder, um, streaming through CloudFront, playing in JW Player across Flash and HTML5, and as you can see, uh, the video player is responsive to the the website, and I think you can look at it yourself by going to Bitly slash cf dash jw slash smw. The HD menu in the JW player automatically uh, shows all the bit rates that are in the HLS stream. So uh, people, if they, if they want, um, they can override the bit rate and for example wait until a higher bit rate than their bandwidth uh, supports is actually slowly downloading. Thank you. Um, like, I think we're we right have, at I think, yeah, we have very little time left. Yeah, we're right at time, so maybe we can just hang around and take questions if they want to turn the floor for, uh, for the next presenters. Yeah, well, if nobody's coming up yet, uh, we can always uh, do <laughs> one or two questions. Or you can come up with the mic and we'll, we can take some questions. Okay. Okay, so we, we should have some time. Okay, great. 
have one question about the transcoding, and that being um, uh, Apple's recommendation for when you have variant bit rates is that you have an absolute worst case fallback that's 64 kilobit and it's audio only or it's audio with just one frame of video. Is that one of the options for transcoding? Just audio only at 64 kilobit? Uh, let's uh, let's see. I don't know the uh, answer off the top of my head, um, but we can look at all the presets that are available here. Uh, so all of the predefined presets are available here already. Uh, and the HLS audio 64K is is an option, so you can select that as one of the options as well. Yeah, in the in the video player, we're actually hiding that option on desktops. Uh, but will um, I mean it will be included in uh, iPhone or, or Android uh, devices? Great, thank you. Sure. Uh, sorry, so you spoke a bit about the DRM earlier on. Can you show us uh, how that would fit in with this? Um, so with HLS. Um, by default, on, on various platforms and devices, full on, a full-on DRX stem is not built in, but you can use uh, a, encryption. So you can use AES-128 encryption. That allows you to encrypt the videos, and the keys are then still served as play, just the keys over HTTPS generally or behind a login. Um, and that works across Flash. Uh, Android and iOS devices, and also uh, OTT devices like Roku, uh, Apple TV, Chromecast. Uh, full on for full on DRM solutions. So if you're looking at Play Ready support, or if you're looking at uh, Flash Access support, um, then you have to basically build mobile apps yourself. Uh, use SDKs from the various vendors to uh, build a DRM solution into your mobile app. For mobile web, there isn't a solution yet. I just want to add to that, there's a variety of DRM solutions available on the AWS Marketplace. If you just search for AWS Marketplace and go there, you'll be able to see a number of different options. Um, what you showed in the uh, workflow there, is all of that available um, programmatically with the API, number one, including callback when everything's done, and, um, and what is not available, I guess, via the API. Right. So. Um, so all of the, uh, so everything that I showed using the console today is available via the API. So uh, configuring Amazon S3 and uploading your content to the to S3 bucket, creating buckets, um, using Amazon Elastic Transcoder, and uh, uh, you know configuring the transcoding pipeline as well as the job, and then finally configuring the CloudFront distribution and tying the distribution back to the bucket where the encoded uh, files are. So all of that end-to-end -end you can do via the API as well as uh, SDKs and uh, AWS CLI. Is, uh, so you can do all of that programmatically. And getting, all, and getting all the renditions that were generated back through the API if we wanted to store it with other metadata. Yes. Offline. Okay. Yes. Great. So both uploads and downloads from S3 uh, are available via the API. Hey, I have a question about how to build upon this infrastructure if I want to have a, uh, you know, the whole uh, video application. So I understand, uh, for example, when, when we ingest the uh, content into Amazon and then, you know, using the transcoding service and the CloudFront CDN delivery, combining with the, uh, the player, I have the basic video playback experience. But of course, to make it useful, I need, um, you know, a, a, I understand S3 bucket as, you know, by itself is not a man system, but how could my, I guess my question is that how could I build on top of this infrastructure to add uh, metadata ingestion, you know, the, the, the workflows, uh, you know, all the, all the video publishing uh, a level higher than the uh, basic uh, video playback experience. How can I uh, take advantage of the the infra infrastructure that you're just building, so. Right, um, so when it comes to uh, you know, AWS, what we provide is uh, basic building block infrastructure services, like S3, which is you know, really good at storing uh, content with high durability, or CloudFront for global delivery of content, or Transcoder for uh, transcoding at scale and at low cost. Um, so in terms of building on top of that, uh, 
you know, as, as I said previously, all of this is available via API. So you can, of course, you know, you've got a couple of different options. One, you can build something on your own that utilizes the APIs and programmatically takes advantage of these services uh, to create a higher level service or a metadata management system and, and so on. Or instead of reinventing the wheel, you can look at the AWS marketplace and there's a variety of, um, uh, you know, software uh, solutions that are available there that run on AWS infrastructure, utilize all of these different services that I talked about uh, and give you that higher level of uh, sort of manageability and control that you're looking for. So there's a, there's a number of different options available there. And if you don't, still don't see something that you're looking for and something that's not meeting your needs, please do contact us and let us know sort of you know, what we should uh, add to the marketplace as a solution that would be useful for you. Yeah, and the same, the same goes for the video player. Uh, JDR player is used a lot uh, as a tool that gets built into uh, services and, and other uh, tools. And again, there is, it's also a matter of like, you can build it yourself and then use the APIs and the, the wizard, the kind of wizard uh, blueprint that we have to, to build that functionality in your own service. Or you can look at pre-built services that are uh, available for, for example, WordPress or Drupal. Thank you. Can you speak about HIPAA compliance for the AWS S3 environment? Uh, I, I'm not an expert on that, so um, I can I can you know take your contact information and refer you to folks who would know a lot more than I would, because okay. uh, I don't want to speak to something that I'm that I'm not too familiar with. Um, there's also a lot of information, just generally, that I wanted to point you to the AWS Security Center. So if you just search for AWS Security Center, you'll be able to see uh, a ton of information on our website around security as well as HIPAA compliance that's available there. In fact, if I remember correctly, we have a white paper just on HIPAA compliance that covers the services that are, uh, that are under that HIPAA umbrella uh, on AWS. Great. So there's some information there as well. Thanks. But yeah, if you talk to me afterwards, I'll be happy to connect you. So Jerome, uh, did I hear you say that uh, the JW player would play ALS files on non-iOS platforms without resorting to Flash? So um, yes, um, so there is there there are a couple of ways uh, in which we play HLS. JW Player really focuses on HLS because it's a format that allows you to include Apple devices and then uh, like reach everything with one format. Uh, we currently play on on iOS and, and Safari because there it's built in. Uh, we play on Android 4.0 and above devices where we kind of like work around the kinks and the bugs. And we use Flash to reach desktops. Uh, we also have an Android SDK, uh, which you can use to build uh, uh, HLS applications for Android 2.3 and above. So that allows you basically to reach the entire Android platform. But that's for your own application. Um, that, that's our current stack. Uh, we, uh, we're investigating the HTML5 streaming media extension which is a new uh, uh, like HTML5 standard that allows you to um, basically also build HLS in HTML5 uh, browsers. Uh, currently, Chrome has quite robust support for it, and uh, uh, Internet Explorer 11 has uh, support for it on the Windows 8 platform. So it, it's very limited still, but it is coming, and, and we expect other browsers uh, to also implement it, so we can basically move from Flash all the way to HTML5. Okay. Thank you. Great. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much for uh, attending the session.